Uh, thank you, Jennifer, and thank you to the Chamber for having us here today. Um, my name is Tim Powers. I'm with Innovative Solar. We're what's known as an EPC solar developer. Uh, we're a firm based out of Salton, Indiana, uh, who works exclusively with commercial utility uh, and industrial solar projects, uh, both in the finance, turnkey service commissioning, and uh, design development, and uh, every other service that's bundled in that category. So um, I... I got to say, I'm not a fan of uh, COVID speaking rooms because this feels much bigger than it needs to be right now for what I'm hoping to talk about here today. But um, yeah, I will try to get through this fairly complicated piece of regulatory uh, policy in the next half hour, and we'll get to questions here at the very end. Uh, so on this screen here, you've got two systems which are uh, behind the meter solar generation assets. One is the 13 megawatt uh, carport array up at Michigan State University, which we completed about five years ago. That's the Western Hemisphere's largest uh, carport array. Uh, and then in the uh, bottom half, uh, the rooftop system there, that is a IKEA distribution center over in Maryland, which used to be one of the largest uh, rooftop systems in the world at five megawatts. Um, both of these are projects which kind of pertain to what I'll be talking about today and um, how those owners and future projects very similar to those could be, uh, have new assets and new revenue opportunities through what's going to be uh, happening through the first quarter, this first quarter 2222. Um, a quick rundown of the solar industry as it stands here, gonna, heading toward the end of 2021, and also a special focus on, on Indiana. Uh, the cost of solar has dropped about 90% in the last decade, which is pretty exciting for folks who work in it. Um, you know, it's no longer a question of does solar work, it's is it, how is it going to work for a certain customer or a certain type of, of uh, you know, off-taker in the market these days. Um, you know, we've worked exclusively with, with universities who have a very good appetite for clean energy, um, supply chain uh, producers, manufacturers who want to be uh, a leading edge in the the clean energy, uh, or sorry, in the um, in clean energy clean energy supply chain, um, which really helps them hang on to key customers and also uh, retain, I guess, uh, hang on, achieve, get attached to new ones. Um, so the uh, solar really is thriving. There's about 250,000 jobs right now in the industry and growing. Um, the infrastructure package, which uh, the gentleman ahead of me just mentioned, is definitely going to give a big boost to our industry, and we expect nothing really but a good, healthy growth over the next coming three to five years for, for ourselves right now. Um, to touch on Indiana very briefly, uh, just so we can all wrap our heads around the state policy and where the market stands right now, uh, there's about a, one gigawatt of solar installed in the state right now. That's about 0.67% uh, of the state's entire energy portfolio. Uh, there's about 3,300 3, jobs supporting that, uh, that, uh, that installed capacity that work in the solar industry. That's installation, construction, design, finance, uh, operation, and maintenance, the whole breadth of what it's going to go into, um, you know, what goes into design, development, and construction of a solar project. In the next five years, uh, that one gigawatt is expected to turn into 4.5 gigawatts. That includes both utility and commercial, industrial, and residential across the state. Uh, for those of us uh, like myself, we're from the northern part of the state uh, where the permacloud is absolutely a real thing. Uh, many folks will come to us and say, how in the world do you make solar work in a state that is known for not necessarily being the sunniest state out there? Um, you know, a lot of that is improvement in technology. Uh, when I started in solar five years ago, you had the average um, panel, solar panel, uh, right around maybe 250, 270 watts uh, per panel. Today we're quoting projects with up to 500 watts per panel. Um, so a doubling in five years is, is definitely a significant adder to cost uh, benefit to how we make these products work for our customers. Uh, to touch on the policy side very briefly here, um, because this is going to be important to what we talk about down the road here with Brick Order 222. Two, two. Uh, in Indiana, um, commercial industrial customers can do, typically do one, what, about a megawatt of solar for reference. That's about five acres or roughly $1.4 million worth of solar. That's enough to offset a, per, approximately one uh, you know, middle school or so or like a very small factory. Um, so folks will not be 
setting off, offsetting uh, anywhere close to 100% of their load in Indiana. That, that one megawatt cap is statewide. Um, uh, on top of that, currently net metering is going to be shifting to an EDF tariff uh, starting next July. So folks who are not installing solar both on their homes, but also on businesses, churches, schools, that kind of thing, um, before next July, we'll, we'll be switched to an EDF rate, uh, EDG tariff rate, um, which is lesser than what the current net metering standard is. So um, uh, it is still a very good market for what we, uh, when we go to customers and think of a proposal for a project and say, you know, we expect you guys will have about a six to seven year payback on a one megawatt system in Indiana. Uh, after next summer, we'd expect that number to go up slightly, depending on what that customer's use, usage load is. Uh, but the good news is that for quarter 222 is going to hopefully offset some of that, that downturn that we expect to, to come along here. So to dive into the high-level policy and federal regulatory side of, of this uh, this item. So the, as most of us know, FERC is the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Uh, it's the independent agency which regulates interstate transmission and wholesale electricity, electricity sales across the United States. Uh, every single colored um, uh, independent system operator on there, uh, except for ERCOT down in Texas, the dark, dark green one, is, is regulated by, by FERC. Uh, FERC provides a number of services, um, number of services to each of those, those providers. Uh, we currently sit in, I, be, I believe we're in, uh, Indianapolis is in, is in MISO, the big orange one there, that's the mid, mid-continent independent system operator. PGM is splits Indiana, uh, Pennsylvania, Jersey, Maryland, right down the middle. Um, and it, it's important to kind of talk about this so it can make a little more sense of what we're going to get to at the order here in a little bit. Um, but just very briefly, ISO markets offer a range of services. Um, probably the number one benefit of those is resiliency, uh, grid stability, um, and an open market for utilities uh, and electric providers to go to the open market when and if they need um, you know, extra power if for some reason uh, congestion is getting bad for them, uh, and ancillary services as well, resource adequacy, capacity, all these are benefits that these ISOs offer to ultimately utilities, but it makes the ratepayers' lives much easier because um, utilities are not passing on uh, charges to those, those ratepayers down the road uh, if they're going out to the open market independently and buying a lot of power that uh, they need to serve maybe high demand in the summer or something like that. So a background on this order. Um, it is an interesting name for an order. Uh, uh, perhaps somewhat interestingly, the, one of the commissioners for FERC, this is his daughter's birthday, and he decided this is going to be a, a proper uh, number for it, so they assigned this to that. I don't have any more background on why he did that, uh, but this is why we have this long, uh, this long order number for this, this particular uh, piece of regulatory uh, uh, action that came out. So in the background of this, um, FERC order 841, uh, essentially removed smaller um, scale storage the obstacles that surrounded those and how they participate in these ISO markets uh, back in 2018. And in some ways, this order uh, created more questions than it answered. Um, for the biggest issue was that it did not provide a clear compensation rate of how storage could be valued in those in, um, in ISOs and in, in defense system operator territories. Uh, so, you know, this hasn't really helped the storage market grow necessarily in the last couple of years. The important part is that this order did open the door for FERC 2222 to be passed in September of last year. Um, for a long time, for a long time, uh, FERC has really wanted to clarify and allow DERs, uh, distributed energy resources, to participate in the wholesale market. Um, and I'll get to what DERs exactly are in here in a moment. Um, but 841 was kind of a precursor to this new order which came out, um, which in essence re removes the barriers not only to storage, but all DERs in markets which are going to be selling their power from systems as small as residential systems into the open wholesale market. 
uh, it provides a range of benefits to both utilities and and uh, the ISOs themselves. Um, uh, so we can get to those in a little bit here. Um, to break down a little more what the, the order really touched on and, and uh, aimed to, to fix, uh, it allows for fair compensation of uh, distributed energy resources in power markets. Uh, it identifies qualified DERs. Um, you know, an example is, again, commercial solar systems, which are under 20 megawatts, residential solar, um, including, uh, it also includes electric vehicles, which is fantastic for UEV owners out there. Uh, even includes, um, uh, this was news to me, uh, uh, grid-tied heating, water heaters, and air conditioning units, which um, for certain HVAC systems with high efficiency uh, and fancy efficiency, efficiency controls, a lot of folks will be able to actually enter the market through those systems that if they're owned by commercial owners, private owners, whatever it's going to be. Um, so these bit, prior to this order coming out, the wholesale markets really had a lot of barriers which uh, prevented these DRs coming in, and the, this, goal, this order really uh, worked to, to clear those up. Um, there were size requirements that is going to be changed. Um, and the, size, the ability to participate in these markets is going to be not contingent on the, the, uh, the DER size itself. Uh, and then the criteria and the valuation of what those DERs are being paid when they provide capacity services, ancillary services, energy resources to the, the open market, that's going to be um, something that's available to them moving forward here uh, in, in, at the end of next year. Uh, the, or the order did identify several benefits, which we will get to here in a moment. Uh, and most importantly, it directs the independent system operators to create a participation model, uh, which allows those DERs to enter that open wholesale market. So this is uh, uh, Chairman Chatterjee uh, being very excited about for quarter 2222. Typically, f uh, for Chairman, not historically, made big press releases, made big announcements in regards to these orders. Um, but as you can see here, he was actually very excited that this was finally passed, um, you know, under his tenure, frankly. Uh, you know, to quote here at the bottom, it's, uh, it's, he indicates how it's going to increase competition and efficiencies in, in all FERC markets. Uh, it also enhances the grid flexibility and reliability of all their attributes. Uh, and most importantly, it stimulates the kind of innovation, the kind of innovation that's needed to keep pace with ever-evolving ever uh, energy demands here in the United States. Uh, so what exactly falls under the definition of a, a distributed energy resource? Uh, I actually get this question all the time at my own firm, and it's a great question because there's so many resources that actually fall under this. Uh, solar is an easy one, both residential and commercial. Uh, typically, anything under, under 20 megawatts is going to qualify for a DER. Um, typically, that's going to be privately owned, not a front-of-the-meter utility uh, asset. The um, residential, which is going to eventually be participating in this wholesale market, is going to be typically aggregated as my very, very, uh, you know, baseload understanding of how that's going to work. Uh, so typically residential solars will be approached by some kind of energy broker or aggregator who would then in turn uh, bundle a package of the residential systems and work with those owners to sell their power into the open market at times, uh, you know, basically peak power demand times when, when the market is really pulling and needing more energy and the homeowners can afford to, to you know, off, I guess, provide some of the power themselves. Uh, energy storage is absolutely another member of this category for DER. Uh, you've got the uh, power wall getting some free advertisement through this there. Um, that's a residential home system. That is essentially the same battery that comes out 12, a uh, 12 kilowatt hour battery that comes out of a, your standard Tesla car, just mounted on the wall of a home. Uh, those typically have enough power within them to, to power your home fridge for about 10 to 12 hours uh, during a blackout. Um, there's this misconception sometimes that if you have storage on your home and enough solar panels back up or other, some kind of other energy generation on site, that you can go off-grid entirely. That's typically not what we recommend. 
the grid does provide a host of ancillary services, and we'd encourage folks to stay interconnected to that. Um, and for this new order is just another reason as why folks want to stay reconnected and never go off grid um, for both home or business. Uh, you know, you're getting new new revenue shares through any home so, so home storage system that you might uh, one day have. Uh, Cogeneration assets that includes biodigesters, biofuel. Uh, I mentioned EV chargers, and then also this responsive heat water heaters and air conditioning units. I did have some pictures of that, but they didn't really do those justice, so I just left them off this and kept things simple for everyone here. So um, being the benefits of why FERC wanted to get this through and how they expect it will benefit the grid as well as uh, utilities and energy providers, um, retail, retail energy um, you know, sellers. Uh, so the DR assets are going to let um, the ISOs alleviate some demand and stress on the grid in the most you know, simplest of layman's terms. Uh, DRs in grid areas that are, are far from generation sites, so you know, rural Indiana, the UP of Michigan, those locations which, you know, sometimes will have higher KWH, KWH rates for electricity. Um, if you can put a couple megawatts out there, both of residential solar, some other form of energy generation, that alleviates stress on the grid. Uh, it prevents brownouts. It, prevent, it doesn't prevent blackouts necessarily if that's going to be something that utilities are trying to avoid. Um, but it definitely alleviates congestion uh, on the grid, which is a fantastic benefit to, to both you know, ultimately the ISO, but as well as the energy provider in that, in that territory and region. Um, this, this order was really, another int intention of this from FERC was for this order to uh, ensure a just and reasonable energy rate through increased competition um, by having DERs entering this market. Um, you know, simple economics says that when you have increased supply, competition goes up, prices go down. That's the intention of what FERC was hoping to do with this. Uh, and that is you know, that is kind of a to-be to be determined at this point, but that is one of the long-term goals that FERC is uh, taking with this, with this step by, by them. Uh, on the utility side, um, we expect electric utilities to have a better guidance around system planning. Uh, you know, every year, every couple of years, utilities go to their utility regulatory commission uh, with a rate case, either for just general rate cases, but also for infrastructure sometimes as well. Um, FERC is hoping that in some way this will delay how uh, infrastructure is planned. Um, if it's not quite needed as much, if you have a new DER competition in the market, um, you don't need nearly as much new generation coming online. If you expect that the number of megawatts of new solar is going to be installed in the next you know, three to five, ten years, whatever it's going to be. Uh, down there at the bottom, uh, in the next five years, you know, FERC looked at this in, uh, in conjunction with NREL, the Renewable Energy Laboratory. They project that between 65 and 385 gigawatts of new uh, capacity energy will be entering the market in the next five years, which is a pretty hefty amount, right? Um, for the very basic terms, there's 1,000 kilowatts in a megawatt, 1,000 megawatts in one gigawatt. Um, so you're talking about some serious market uh, uh, jumps in how much energy is out there on the distributed uh, energy, distributed energy uh, resource side of, of the grid. Um, so another utility benefit, improved real-time load management, uh, reduce, reduce congestion, which uh, ultimately should help ratepayers' rates come down in some form in the long term, and then greater clarity and specificity around market rules. Uh, a lot of folks have asked for to look at this and put more rules around it, and that's what they did ultimately to try and clarify how things would be handled uh, moving forward with, with DERs. So in terms of the DER ownership side, the, uh, the major benefit is going to be new revenue, right? I've been touching on this a couple of times. If you're a residential homeowner of a solar system, uh, an aggregator would hopefully be utilizing some of your capacity and energy resources to ultimately offer you extra revenue over the long term and lifetime of your solar array by allowing your system to participate in the open market of, of energy sales, essentially. 
Um, this really is a big benefit to the behind the meter system, uh, solar systems out there as well as, as, well as other DERs. Um, you know, it, just because you're participating in this market doesn't mean that you're still not offsetting your own power um, for whatever you signed up for originally. If, you know, uh, your solar provider said you would offset 30% of your location site, uh, or your, excuse me, your, let's say your facility, you can still continue to do that. Uh, those times you might have been net metering to the, util to the local utility. If for some reason the open wholesale market is offering you more, um, I would, you know, it seems like there would be an opportunity to potentially engage in contract for that kind of power offset um, long term, which is, be obviously, is obviously a big benefit to the, the owner of whatever that DER is going to be. Uh, so to look at an example, uh, sorry, um, so in the red there, uh, the, the big question, and unfortunately, when I, you know, saw this, uh, when folks had this come out and saw this first quarter come out last year, they were hoping that sometimes, at some point this year, there would be clarity on what exactly the rates that DRs might be offered. Um, there will be a host of rates based on your system size, uh, what kind of services you're providing, uh, what kind of energy, you know, resource it is possibly and where on the grid it is, um, you know. In California, you might get paid more than you do in central uh, Missouri, for instance. Um, but we can't, we, we ourselves, for instance, and innovators cannot go to a customer just yet and say, we expect your system will make this much more in saving and revenue uh, after this order passes and you enter the wide wholesale market at some point. Uh, we have to put the brakes on that at this point and wait for the ISOs to um, implement their participation programs uh, probably late next year in 2022. Um, I did put the time together of putting together an example still of Indi an Indiana standard one megawatt solar array. So a commercial system here, which you know typically will build for about 1.4, 1.5 million dollars, um, will have a payback for that customer on average about six years, which is a pretty healthy number um, considering that we saw that over 10 years, just four or five years ago here. Uh, annual savings of close to 100,000, and then over 3 million in total savings of the lifetime of the system when you factor in, uh, you know, rising energy costs and that kind of thing, and degradation of the system. Um, when you add in the FERC order 222, uh, you know, implementation and uh, the benefits that we hope and expect that will come from uh, folks participating in that open wholesale market, uh, the economic value increases of your, your behind the meter solar array, which is, which is great, or any DER asset for that matter. Um, especially with step down in that metering next year, or the switch from net metering to those EDG uh, tariffs uh, for Indiana uh, ratepayers in next summer, um, this order is gonna be, this, or this, this opportunity is gonna be pretty valuable for most Indiana ratepayers. So just as give an idea of how much solar is currently installed in Indiana, um, this map is not the most clear, uh, but it is a registry of every, uh, or as many uh, systems across the state that have been registered in this database. This is every single residential, commercial, um, even a few small utility systems across the state. Most of these are under one megawatt. Um, if the right one is the South Bend, Goshen, Elkhart area, um, it just gives you an idea of how much solar is currently operating out there on the grid. Uh, and the good news is that folks who are already operating do not need to change anything about their system to participate in this uh, new market once it becomes available. Um, that was very clear in the order when they, they put that out there. They want existing, existing producers and DR owners to be able to participate once the system comes online. Uh, I won't dig too much in the next steps because I think we're getting close to my, the end of my time here. Um, but the major uh, next item here is for the ISOs to implement their tariff implementation programs. Uh, and that will come out, it, it seems, next summer. At that point, we'll have a lot more clarity on just what kind of rates these DRs can be getting paid in the open market. And uh, we will go to questions here. We'll have a little bit of time left. Any questions on DERs and sales in the market? Yep.
Yep. So the question is, if a restaurant producing grease and is putting that into some kind of generator, does that generator get paid under this, this order? Uh, the simple answer is yes, it does. Um, depends probably how big the generator is exactly, but uh, not a dumb question. Um, and, and the simple answer is yes, but we just don't know quite how much yet at this point. Yes, it will. Uh, capacity is a very important part of you know, the ISO service that they provide. Uh, and again, that's going to be, there will be many tariffs for each kind of system generation uh, of various DERs when this program comes out for the independent ISOs. And they could differ between ISOs, which is going to be even more confusing. Um, but, but yes, capacity is actually absolutely a value that, uh, that FERC recognizes these DERs provide, and they want to compensate them for that. I think, Steve, you had a question, too. Uh, there is. Uh, that has that at uh, 87 megawatts. Uh, and that's, uh, again, mostly residential and small commercial systems across the state. Uh, it was a question, what's the negotiated value of carbon credit? Yeah, I, I'm definitely not the person to ask about that, unfortunately, here. So uh, I'm sure someone could maybe help Steve after this is over. Uh, one more quick question. I think I'm definitely out of time. Yeah, um, so I will preface this by saying that the question is how um, will storage, uh, or sorry, electric vehicles be valued in this, in this new market in this, under this order? Uh, I will preface this by saying I'm not an EV expert, but the understanding from FERC, the, the message from FERC is that because they provide essentially a storage component to the grid, um, they can act as, uh, they, they, they check the box of all the criteria. They want to see them providing, again, ancillary services, energy, uh, and capacity um, in the grid. So, yes, they're essentially just batteries on wheels, and when they're plugged into your home or your, even your business carport, uh, they are functioning the same as a typical grid-type battery in, in essence. Yeah. Um, thank you to the Chamber and everyone for listening. Uh, I will be available after.